Greetings YouTubers and welcome to the third episode of my series on geochronology. My name is PhD Tony and today we're going to be talking about radiometric dating techniques. Regular viewers may have noticed that I'm using a new software package to create these slides with a different color scheme. It turns out that this package had been on my computer the entire time, I was just blissfully unaware of its existence. So now that I know it's there, I'm just experimenting. Let me know how you think it looks in the comment section below. But let's get on with the science. Radiometric dating is one of the most powerful tools available to geochronologists. If applied carefully, it can provide accurate dates over an incredibly large range of timescales. Accordingly, it has received an enormous amount of academic attention and has been studied in meticulous detail by a vast array of enormously talented individuals. A massive body of associated literature has been accumulated, which analyzes in fine detail every complication and subtlety that has so far been encountered, and attempts to further increase the resolution and accuracy of these techniques. On the other side of the debate, we have the Young Earth Creationist Movement. As with any top-notch anti-science movement confronted by a discipline that completely destroys their belief system, they simply reject radiometric dating. In fact, they reject geochronology as a whole, and claim that it is simply impossible to understand the sequence of events that have occurred. As we shall see in this presentation, their position is asinine, evidence-free nonsense. But I digress. Radiometric dating is based on the physical process of radioactive decay. It has long been observed that some isotopes of particular chemicals are unstable and emit radioactive particles through time. This instability is caused by an imbalance in the forces that hold the nucleus together. In this situation, the nucleus wants to progress to a more stable configuration, and it can do this in one of a number of ways. We will start with alpha decay. In this case, the nucleus emits an alpha particle, which is comprised of two neutrons and two protons. As a result of this emission, the nucleus changes in both mass and atomic number. In the case of beta decay, one of the neutrons inside the nucleus decays into a proton and an electron. The electron is then emitted by the nucleus. In some instances, this can actually work in reverse. A proton inside the nucleus can capture an electron and become a neutron. In either circumstance, the atomic number of the nucleus changes by one, but the mass remains relatively unchanged. These particle emissions are normally accompanied by the emission of a high-energy photon known as a gamma ray. In some circumstances, particle emission can lead the nucleus in a highly energetic or excited state. The nucleus will then transition from this state by emitting a gamma ray. To simplify our terminology a little, we describe the initial isotope as the parent isotope and the target isotope that it is decaying into as the daughter isotope. For a sample of a given isotope, the time it takes for half the atoms in that sample to decay into the daughter isotope is known as the isotopic half-life. Because it is critically important for nuclear physicists to well understand what is occurring during a nuclear reaction, a significant amount of effort has been dedicated to accurately determining the half-lives of a wide range of isotopes. Given an accurate value for the half-life of the parent isotope, and an accurate value for the relative abundance of the daughter isotope in the initial configuration, we can deduce the age of a given sample from its current state, under the assumption that the sample has not undergone any corruption in the meantime. It turns out that in a lot of cases we actually have a very good idea of the initial concentration of the daughter isotope from general geochemical observations. For some systems this requires some skill, but geochemists are very clever that way. And over the years they've managed to compile an extensive list of isotopic abundances for a wide range of geochemical systems. The table on the left here shows a list of radioactive elements that are commonly used in radiometric dating studies each listed with its corresponding half-life. Carbon-14 and aluminium-26 are listed in red because they are actually a special class of radioactive isotope known as cosmogenic radioisotopes. I will be discussing cosmogenic radioisotopes in a later episode, and carbon-14 will be the subject of its own dedicated episode. On the right-hand side of this slide, we see the decay chain for uranium-235 to lead-207. As we can see, this is a very complex decay chain with a great many intermediate steps, but that is actually a very good thing. If we imagine a sample that contains uranium-235 but none of the intermediate daughter products, 
then the ratio of the daughter products in the sample should be in proportion to their half-lives, which are listed in the table. And that makes it kind of easy to detect whether or not the system has been perturbed somehow. We can detect whether or not there's been a perturbation if any of these intermediate samples are not in the correct proportion. But how can we know what the initial concentration of these intermediate isotopes was? Well, it turns out that two of the longer-lived intermediate isotopes, thorium and protactinium, are not soluble in water. So if we're dealing with a mineral system that precipitated from a watery environment, like a coral or a stalagmite, then the only way that there can be thorium or protactinium in the sample is because of radioactive decay. We can be absolutely certain that the initial concentrations of these isotopes is zero. It turns out that there is a sister decay chain, from uranium-238 to lead-206. This is even more complicated and involves even more intermediate steps. This gives us even more opportunity to confirm that the sample integrity has been preserved, that there's been no corruption, and because protactinium and thorium both appear in the intermediate decay chain, we can be similarly confident about the initial state of marine precipitates. We now also have an inbuilt cross-check for any sample that has uranium in it. We can compare the age estimated using one technique against the age estimated using the other. This cross-checking of ages can actually be generalized because there are a large number of radiometric dating techniques available to us. If two techniques applied to the same sample produce widely divergent results, then there is obviously a very serious problem that must be addressed. Geochronologists vastly prefer that the age of a sample be confirmed by comparing results from multiple techniques. Cross-checking of different radiometric systems to ensure consistency and accuracy is very common practice in the geochronological literature. This is a very serious problem for the young earth creationist position because it is very difficult to see how random errors can produce consistent results. Now that we have a bit of an understanding of how these radiometric techniques work, let's have a look at how they are applied. In general terms, any rock is a collection of crystals that have been concreted together somehow. The most useful of these crystals for our current purposes are zircons. Here we see some individual zircons that have been magnified. We can use a high-resolution ion microprobe to sample an individual zircon at different points, and we see an example in the lower right-hand corner here. In this particular example, we can see that the older inner section of the crystal has been surrounded by a younger, more recent accretion. We can thus determine that at the time the outer layer was deposited, conditions were warm enough for there to be molten material, but not so hot as to destroy the innermost crystal. Careful application of these techniques allows us to reconstruct a highly detailed history of the thermochemical conditions experienced by the crystal. It turns out that this information is extremely useful for mineral exploration companies. The formation of mineral deposits depends critically on the thermal and geochemical conditions that apply. As a result, regional geochemical and geochronological studies can be used to identify particular locations at which valuable mineral deposits are most likely to have formed. These techniques have proven to be repeatedly reliable and accurate, and mineral exploration companies have invested heavily in their development and application. None of this is consistent with the young earth creationist argument that these techniques are inherently unreliable and inaccurate. As is often the case with inherently anti-scientific movements, young earth creationists like to make it appear that they are being rational and dispassionate that all they're doing is identifying assumptions that the scientific establishment have made and have failed to adequately address. They have three principal objections, all of which are variations on the same theme. One, they claim that isotopic half-lives are not constant through time, that they have in fact been reduced by many orders of magnitude since the creation. Two, they claim that it is not possible to accurately constrain the initial concentration of the daughter isotope. 3. They claim that it is not possible to recognize when a sample has been altered by some process after its formation. Basically, these all boil down to the same point. We're talking about the past when we weren't there. We didn't see those tree rings actually forming. We didn't see those layers being laid down. It's like the dating methods. You're assuming things in regard to the past uh, that aren't necessarily true. Well, of course I wasn't there. If I was there, I wouldn't need the bloody sample dated, would I? I'd know how old it was. But beyond the obvious logical absurdity of this position, there is a vastly more sinister aspect to it. 
The purpose of science is not to provide certainty. The purpose of science is to provide the most accurate estimate that we can, given the constraints that we are operating under. There is also an implicit assumption that professional geochronologists are not aware of these issues and have not dedicated significant effort to addressing them. It's also difficult not to be infuriated by the sneeringly cynical hypocrisy of the young earth creationist position. If we accept that I wasn't there and I don't know, then why do we accept the testimony of the author of Genesis who clearly wasn't present during the creation or any of the other events he reports on? We have already seen that by using multiple radiometric dating techniques, or by comparing the relative abundances of daughter isotopes in a decay chain, we can actually detect when a sample has been corrupted. Similarly, we have seen that there are geochemical situations where we can actually constrain the initial abundance of the relative isotopes. Further, the agreement between different radiometric techniques shows that half-lives cannot just have randomly fluctuated. If that were the case, then these different techniques would not produce consistent results. So the only remaining possibility is that somehow the half-lives of the various isotopes have systematically changed. As a general rule, it seems safe to assume that the laws of physics have not undergone radical change as a function of time. If anything can happen without rhyme or reason or obeying the laws of physics, then all bets are off and we cannot know anything that happened in the past. So we generally assume that the laws of physics are reasonably stable, unless there is some evidence to suggest that this is not the case. Is there any evidence that suggests that the half-lives of isotopes can change? In 2006 and 2007, a series of publications appeared in the literature that seemed to suggest that actually, yes, isotopic half-lives can change in response to environmental conditions. But when someone publishes a paper saying, look, physics up till now has been completely wrong and no one noticed except for us, you generally should wait for that result to be confirmed before you accept it unconditionally. The results reported in these papers were investigated in detail by John Goodwin. He repeated the original experiments using a highly sophisticated and vastly more precise experimental setup, and he was able to demonstrate that no variation in isotopic half-life could be observed in response to varying environmental conditions, with one exception, that being the decay by electron capture of beryllium-7. Beryllium-7 is an unusual isotope, it has a very small nucleus, and it only has the two electron shells, and what's happening to the valence electrons can impact the distribution of electrons in the inner shell, which will impact the potential for electron capture. So it is understandable that this particular isotope is more sensitive. But this isotope isn't used in geochronology, and even if it were, the observed variation in isotopic half-life is only 0.9 of a percent which is nowhere near large enough to explain a 4 billion year age discrepancy. There have also been some suggestions in the literature that distance to the sun or space weather may influence isotopic half-lives, but these results are highly contentious, strongly argued against, and are not accepted as demonstrated. Goodwin's experiments may have ruled out beta decay varying as a function of environmental conditions, but what about alpha decay? Here are some papers arguing that alpha decay does indeed depend on temperature. Surely this supports the young earth creationist position. Everybody thinks they know what temperature means. There's hot stuff and there's cold stuff. In hot stuff, the mean velocity of the component molecules and atoms is higher. They're moving faster. They're more energetic. That's why it's hot. As with a lot of concepts in physics, this level of understanding may be satisfactory for a macroscopic non-relativistic observer. But for a nuclear physicist, it's meaningless and useless. They instead define temperature using concepts from statistical mechanics. And the temperature dependence of alpha decay that they're talking about is that observed in the interior of stars. So closer inspection of the literature suggests that there is very little support for the concept of isotopic half-lives changing as a function of time. But let's entertain the suggestion nonetheless. It turns out that we have access to samples that have come from very different pressure and temperature regimes. We have samples from Earth, of course, the Moon, Mars, the asteroid belt, and, surprisingly enough, interstellar space. None of these samples yield ages that are consistent with a young Earth. But they all yield ages that are consistent with one another, and consistent with our best estimates for the age of the Sun. 
So all of this pretty much rules out the possibility that pressure or temperature effects could have a significant impact on isotopic half-lives. But what if we're wrong, or there's some other physical effect that we're unaware of? Well, if that were the case, radiation would then have been entering Earth's atmosphere at 2 million times the modern rate, which means that every man, woman, child, animal and plant would have been experiencing more than one chest x-ray a second for their entire lives. I'm sure the young Earth creationists are already lining up their excuses, like combative eight-year-olds on the playground explaining why their particular superhero can beat their friend's superhero. And it will turn out that Adam and his descendants had yet another superpower to add to all the others they have that made them immune to these adverse effects. It's less clear how they will explain the survival of the rest of the biosphere, but they will doubtless think of something. But rather than risk serious injury by attempting to put ourselves into the mindset of young Earth creationists, let's review our position. In the recent past, while we may not have been present, other people were, and they wrote stuff down. We can verify the accuracy of the stuff that was written down by checking it against the archaeological record or the celestial record, or against independent historical records of nearby peoples. Conveniently, the people who wrote stuff down also made stuff out of wood, and because of that we can use dendrochronological techniques to confirm the ages given in the historical record. The extremely close agreement between the historical record, the archaeological record, and the dendrochronological record allows us to conclude that dendrochronology is actually really accurate. Because the records of environmental parameters obtained from tree rings, valves, and ice cores are actually very similar, we can use the accuracy of the dendrochronological record to infer the accuracy of VAR chronologies and ice core records. Similarly, the close agreement between the ice core data and the marine isotope records allows us to infer that the marine isotope records are an accurate sequential record of environmental conditions. The close agreement between magnetic reversal data obtained from ocean floor sediment cores and the broader paleomagnetic record allows us to confirm this initial impression. The marine oxygen isotope data is accurate. We can now test all of our assumptions to date by using radiometric dating. If radiometric dating is flawed, then it cannot possibly agree with the other data sets. If the other data sets are flawed, then they still won't agree with the radiometric data. But in fact, we see very good agreement between the radiometric dates obtained and the ages inferred using these other techniques, which confirms the accuracy of both the techniques themselves and the radiometric methods used to verify them. So, to review what we discussed today, there exist multiple radioactive isotopes, each with different half-lives. These may be used to construct independent age estimates for samples. In general, these age estimates agree with one another and with other dating techniques. A variety of techniques can be used to detect corruption of the sample. Initial isotopic abundances in the system strongly depend on geochemical context, and in most circumstances can be accurately determined. There is no robust evidence that isotopic half-lives change significantly in response to environmental conditions. Even granting the assumption that isotopic half-lives were vastly shorter earlier in Earth's history, this would have resulted in an accelerated radioactive decay and radiation poisoning of every living being on the planet. In short, every young Earth creationist objection to radiometric dating is spurious and directly contradicted by the evidence. Well, that might be where I call an end to this. Thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate it. And I hope you'll join me next time when I will be discussing cosmogenic radioisotopes.